Hi, and welcome back to another Tech Minds video. So, this is the Libra SDR, which has been knocking around online for sale for around a year now. Now, this thing is a little bit of a mystery. Well, at least to me, because there doesn't appear to be any official website or manufacturer documentation that we can refer to to get the thing working. However, let's go over what we do know and what we can actually do with it. Now, it comes with a small Ethernet cable, two USB to USB C cables, and four antennas. Now, all of these four antennas are exactly the same, and that's because there are two receivers and two transmitters within the Libra SDR. So you have four antenna connections. Now, before using these antennas, I was curious about the exact frequency these little antennas were resonant at. So I tested them with my vector network analyzer, and here are the results. So it appears that these antennas are resonant around 2.472 gigahertz, which actually puts them in the range of the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi band. So if you want to use any other frequency between 70 megahertz and 6 gigahertz, then you'll need to ensure your antenna is resonant. Now, what stands out about the Libra SDR is its looks. It's totally encased in what I presume is an aluminium housing, and the top is kind of finned almost like a heat sink. Actually, those fins are used as part of the cooling system to help cool this little SDR, as it does run quite warm. Now, the reason for the excessive cooling is because this little thing uses an XC7Z020FPGA and an AD9363 for the radio transceiver, which actually has a maximum sampling rate of 61.44 MHz. Now, it also has one gigabyte DDR3 32-bit memory running at 1066, and that's along with a VCTXO with an initial frequency accuracy of 0 0.5 ppm. It also supports an external clock input of 10 megahertz. Now, later in the video, we'll check out the stability of this SDR when it's transmitting without the use of an external input. Now, the onboard Ethernet adapter supports up to one gigabit, so it has plenty of headroom for lots of data transfer across your network. Now, a closer look at the hardware, and on one end, we have the Ethernet socket. There's also a DFE button just below this. And to the right of the Ethernet socket, there's an OTG USB-C socket. And then to the right again of that, there's another USB-C port, which is labeled as a debug port. Now, below the debug port, there's a micro SD card slot, which can be used to run firmware. Now, you'll also notice two gold colored sockets, which can be used to feed an external clock. Now, the other end is quite boring. It just has the four SMA sockets, which is where you connect your antennas to. You have two RX channels and two TX channels. So the question is, how do we load firmware onto the Libra SDR? Now, depending on the seller of the Libra SDR that you choose, you may be offered firmware or you may not be. However, I spent some time trying to locate websites which may hold at least some form of working firmware. The easiest way to test the Libra SDR is to use a specially patched version of the Adam Pluto firmware. And for this, I found three different GitHub repositories. The first was this one, which is based on version 0.37 of the Adam Pluto firmware. And from this GitHub page, you do need to compile the firmware yourself on a Linux machine. I then found a fork of this firmware, which proved to be a little bit more for user friendly. Now this is because there was pre-compiled libraries available for download. Now these binaries are actually based on version 0.38 of the Adam Pluto firmware. Now what's also interesting about this particular GitHub repository is that there are a few different versions of the firmware available to download. And what I mean by different is that when each one was compiled, a certain level of overclock was added. Now the Libra SDR will actually accept overclocked firmware. Now, personally, I did not get much success with anything other than the base firmware, but each of these downloads are essentially SD card images, or at least files that should be placed on a FAT32 formatted SD card and then inserted into the Libra SDR before powering on. So if you want to try these, try them out and let me know how you get on with them in the comments section. 
And lastly, I found this page where the user is starting to build a collective resource for everything about the Libra SDR. They've even created a specific folder structure to help you find the correct firmware. So with this repository downloaded, I formatted a 32 gigabyte SD card using FAT32. I then located the folder called Working FW or Working Firmware and then copied the contents of the folder to the root of an SD card. At this point, I popped the SD card into the Libra SDR and then powered it on. Now you can also plug in an ethernet connection if you want to. The firmware should load from the SD card, but you will need the SD card installed all the time. However, the Libra SDR does have internal flash and whether this is the correct way or not, to write the firmware to the flash, I copied the boot and Pluto.frm files to the storage device folder that appears when the Libra SDR was plugged into my computer via USB. I then removed the SD card and then clicked eject on the Windows Explorer of the Libra SDR. Now at this point, the Libra SDR blue LED started to flicker, indicating that it was writing the firmware. And once complete, the Libra SDR will be accessible from Windows. You will need to make sure that you have the Pluto SDR drivers installed and they are actually included in this GitHub page source download. So let's make a test to see if it's detected and if it actually receives anything. Now I'm going to use SDR++ for this example. Yeah, Master Dream of Pop Trot Charlie returning. Yeah, the ninjas. <laughs> I remember them. Uh, you've also got Mike Six, Delta Bravo, Papa. Pa 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 pa. Heavy, climb in flight level 150. Climb flight level 300, you're ready at 31. Pa 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 pa, heavy. Right, uh, 15 degrees, and the sample level 100, running. 274 down. Well, everything seems to be fine at receiving. Now, SDR only seems to detect Libra SDR via USB, even though I have an Ethernet cable connected to the SDR and my computer is actually on the same network. So, unfortunately, the latest version of SDR doesn't appear to allow you to select a device type and then manually enter an IP address. So, let's try SDR Console. Again, using the search feature within the definitions of SDR Console, it only detects the USB link. So to use SDR console with the Libra SDR over Ethernet, I need to manually add an Adam Pluto definition and then manually enter its IP address. Now, of course, you should be able to get the Libra SDR IP address from the devices list within your network router. Although the default IP address appears to be 192.168.1.10. So it appears that SDR console is also working well with Libra SDR. Now, as mentioned at the start of the video, Libra SDR has a VCTXO and states to have an initial accuracy of 0.5 ppm. Now, the best way for me to test this is to place the Libra SDR into my home built QO100 transceiver setup. This essentially allows me to transmit on 2.4 gigahertz and then receive on 10 gigahertz through the QO100 geostationary satellite at the same time, i.e. full duplex. Transmitting SSB on 2.4 gigahertz and then receiving on 10 gigahertz requires an ultra stable frequency while transmitting. So here I'm just going to disconnect my add-on Pluto, which is actually connected to a GPS DO device for a rock solid 40 MHz external clock and then place the Libra SDR in its place without any external clock. So I made a couple of QSO contacts through QO100 all on the same frequency. I'll take a listen to this to see if you can hear any drift in my transmission. When you hear my voice, that is my voice coming back down from the satellite. And these QSOs were over the time of around 30 minutes. CQ Satellite, CQ Satellite, Mike Zero, Delta, Quebec, Whiskey, from India, Oscar, 91 November, Tango, calling CQ and listening, over. Mike Zero, Delta, Queen, Whiskey, this is uh, Delta Lima, 7 kilowatt, Bravo, Alpha, Delta Lima, 7 kilowatt, Bravo, Alpha, over satellite, QZ. Yeah, Delta Lima, 7 
kilowatt whiskey alpha this is mike zero delta quibit whiskey yeah i've got you no problem at all you're a little bit low on frequency but i can hear you no problem at all uh, the name here is matt mike alpha tango qsl Okay, Matt, very nice. Good afternoon to you. Uh, here is once again Delta Lima 7 Kilowatt Bravo Alpha Kilowatt Baker America. Delta Lima 7 Kilo Bravo Alpha. Sorry about that. I got the call sign wrong before. I typed it down wrong. <laughs> but uh, I've got it right now. So, uh, there. Delta Lima 7 Kilo Bravo Alpha. This is Mike Zero Delta Quebec Whiskey. But um, yeah, today I'm just trying out a different, uh, a different SDR transceiver uh, to see how well it uh, stays on frequency. I normally use an Adam Pluto with a Leo Bodner uh, uh, GPS lock, uh, but today I'm trying a, um, a, it's a. It's called a Libra SDR. It's a kind of a, it's an Adam Pluto kind of clone, or it can run the Adam Pluto firmware. Uh, but um, it's, it's, in, it's encased in uh, in like a solid bit of uh, aluminium. Uh, so uh, I'm just kind of giving it a test um, without any external uh, clock input. It's just using its own internal VCTXO. So we're just going to test it to see how stable it is and see if it drifts. Well, but it appears to stay working much on frequency without the need for an external clock. I guess this is working on par with the Pluto Plus, which has been used by various users on QO100. Now, I did perform a little test in transmitting DATV on the wideband QO100 transponder, but I could not decode my signal, and I think this was related to a little spike right in the middle of my transmission. Now, you can just about see the spike underneath the frequency text here. Now, I'm not sure if that was down to the firmware, hardware, but I do know that with my Adam Pluto, I do not see this center spike on my transmission, so further research will be needed. I guess I've only touched the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, on the Libra SDR, and what it could be possibly used for. I do believe open Wi-Fi and other firmwares have been used, but maybe that's something for future videos. Anyway guys, if you want to know more, I'll leave a link in the description. And until the next video, take care. And I'll see you in the next one.